I would like to welcome you all to the very last talk in the Leading Voices Lecture Series, and it's so nice to see all of you here today and to see so many familiar faces who have been to so many of the talks throughout the summer. This summer in this series has been very special to a lot of us on campus for a lot of reasons. Um, all of the instructors, myself included, that are associated with the public policy course around which much of the series revolves, have been just very impressed by the students in the course and the questions they ask and their growth in learning about public policy. And that has just been wonderful to watch. And you guys have done a really good job this summer. We've been very impressed. More generally, all of Dartmouth sophomores this summer, the faculty and members of the community, have benefited so much by learning directly from many of the people who are making public policy and involved in politics today. So that's just been a wonderful experience for all of us. I'm here today to introduce a lecture and facilitate a discussion between you and one of the leading pollsters in the world, one of my very favorite pollsters in the world, Dr. Frank Newport. I have had the great honor of knowing Dr. Newport for a very long time. A decade and a half ago, he was instrumental in introducing me into the world of polling uh, when I started working in the Princeton office of the Gallup organization a very long time ago. He helped me to transition from an academic who knew very little about how to actually run a survey into a survey researcher over the course of half of a decade. And after I transitioned back into academia, I continued to treasure the kind of applied learning I learned about politics uh, and, and political polling from Dr. Newport and the remarkable team he's cultivated over the years. Um, it has made me a much smarter public opinion scholar and teacher, and I benefit from it, and my students benefit from it on a regular basis. The very first thing you're probably going to notice about Dr. Newport is his pitch-perfect radio voice. And it will come as a little surprise to you that he left a very promising career as an assistant professor of sociology in order to become a radio talk show host many decades ago. He transitioned into working in marketing research in Houston where he was based and eventually made his way to the Gallup organization. At the Gallup organization, he's been editor in chief of the Gallup poll. And he's been in that position for, I believe it's around 20 years or just over 20 years. And the Gallup poll is quite simply the gold standard in public opinion polling in the US and throughout much of the world. And much of that, that reputation in the modern era is due to the leadership of Dr. Newport. His accomplishments are far too extensive to list in detail. Uh, just a few that I want to note. Um, he is the author of many academic journal articles and books, one of which is this one, um, his 2004 book, Polling Matters, Why Leaders Must Listen to the Wisdom of the People. It's a really good book. It's a book that I recommend to a lot of people who are interested in learning more about polling. Sometimes people are very puzzled by how you can ask a random sample of 1,000 people in the US a question about politics and learn from that how the nation as a whole feels about politics. And this has really the clearest possible explanation of that and a very interesting explanation that's nuanced and really talks about a lot of dimensions of polling that people find to be very interesting. Um, and so he is also the current president of the American Association of Public Opinion Research. And like many of our speakers throughout the summer, he's a regular commentator on television programs and radio programs. Unlike many of our speakers from this summer, he is an avowedly nonpartisan person in his approach to his work. And he's remarkably well positioned as a result to speak to many of the issues that we've been talking about this summer, and specifically the role of the public in politics and how they relate to the political system, which so often determines what is possible in politics at all. As such, he's the perfect final speaker for this summer's lecture series, and we'll be able to put many of the things we've heard this summer into an interesting and important context. Please welcome Dr. Frank Newport. Thank you very much, Deb, and it's a pleasure to be uh, here in Hanover in Dartmouth. 
Deb didn't mention it, but one of my uh, sons is a graduate in 04 of Dartmouth, so my wife, uh, Kim, and I had the wonderful opportunity of coming here for four years, from 2000 to 2004, and enjoying everything Dartmouth had to offer. So we were very pleased when um, Deb and the others invited me to come back, and my wife, Kim, came with me because we always enjoy getting back here and seeing how much things have or have not changed. And I was being told the green is sacrosanct. It hasn't changed, and it looks absolutely just as beautiful as it ever has looked when we were here when my son was here in the class of 04. It's kind of a nice transition because uh, when we came for the commencement of, of Cal, our son, in 2004, the commencement speaker was... Jeffrey M. Helt, uh, class of whatever he was, 78 or something, and then I'm told he was uh, your august speaker here in this very forum last week and actually left a question for me. So I don't know Jeffrey M. Helt, but uh, it's a great transition, I think, continuing our Dartmouth experience for us to be back and answering those kind of questions. Dr. George Gallup founded uh, our Gallup organization back in um, the mid-1930s in Princeton, first poll question asked about relief or welfare was in the question, which uh, was published in about October of 1935. And it's important, and I'll come back to it, that that very first question, in fact, was asked about a policy question. That is, in the middle of the Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, presidency and the Depression, Dr. Gallup made the decision that he was going to ask people about what they thought about the government efforts for what they call relief then or, or welfare. And I'm proud to say that we've been keeping that up ever since then, uh, trying to continue to ask Americans questions about what they think uh, should be done and their opinions about uh, the U.S. government. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Let, let me give you a couple of quotes. A politician back just a few weeks ago um, in the middle of the debate on the debt ceiling crisis opined publicly, the public is not paying close attention to the ins and outs of what a, how a treasury option goes. He said about one of the debt ceiling issues. They shouldn't. They're worrying about their family. They're worrying about their jobs. They're worrying about their neighborhood. They have a lot of things on their plate. We're paid to worry about it. And this was an elected representative who said that. Then a few days later, an elected representative said, you know, you have 80% of the American public who support a balanced approach to the debt ceiling. 80% of the American public, he's quoting a poll there, support an approach that includes revenues and includes cuts. So the notion that the American public aren't sold on this is not the problem. Well, both of those utterances came out of the mouth of none other than President Barack Obama. All within a week, he made that first statement on Monday, and then by Friday, he was using the polls to uh, point out the, that the American public were behind his position. All by way of underscoring, one of the points that I'm going to make here in, in my few minutes of remarks before we talk is that there is a lot of ambivalence out there in the part of the American public uh, and a part of elected officials in particular about how you use public opinion in a representative democracy like we have. Senator Phil Graham, former senator from Texas, I remember this well, said, the people of Texas, the wise people, the fair people did not elect me to read those polls. George W. Bush, who was the governor of Texas, said, if elected president, he said proudly, I will not use my office to reflect public opinion. And he said that actually all the way through his administration. I will not pay attention to, to polls. Actually, I well remember when I was working in Houston, as, as uh, Deb said, we did research for the Texas Rangers baseball team. And at the time, they were in Arlington, Texas, which, as you know, the stadium situated between Dallas and Fort Worth, and they were contemplating moving. And they, one of the places they could move was over to the Dallas side of the Fort Worth Metroplex. And they hired our firm to do a lot of marketing research and asked baseball fans and I, where they would go. And I came back and reported to the chairman of the Texas Rangers, definitely you should put the stadium in Dallas. That's where the population is, what all of our data suggests is where it should go. And so the chairman of the Texas Rangers baseball team said, thank you very much. And a week later announced it was staying right there in Arlington, right? Well, that chairman was George W. Bush, I'm glad to say. So I learned early on that he did not have the highest of, uh, of respect for marketing research in public. He was going to do what he thought was best, regardless of what other people said. But then again, I'm reminded of the quote from uh, the deposed Governor Gray Davis, which I always like this, when he was about to leave office after he had been recalled by the people and thrown out of office. And, and uh, Austrian uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger took over from him. And one of his last quotes he gave in an interview to the New York Times was, I didn't stay in touch with the people. That's clearly my biggest regret. Voters are the source of all wisdom. You have to conduct an ongoing dialogue with them. 
So again, an exemplification of this, uh, this distinction we have, this dialogue between people on the one hand who say, I don't pay attention to polls or people, and on the other hand, people who say, voters are the font of all wisdom, we need to pay attention to them. Uh, we had an Englishman several centuries ago who said, your representative owes you his industry only, but also his judgment, and he betrays you instead of serving you if he sacrifices his judgment to your opinion, i.e., he should not pay attention to your opinion. Then another wise man about 50 years ago said, that's why public opinion polls are important today. Representatives are better able to represent if they have an accurate measure of the wishes, aspirations, and needs of different groups within the general public. Well, the first of those people was Edmund Burke, who was a famous philosopher, thinker back in Eng England, who came up with this model that you should not be paying attention to polls once you're there as a representative. And that second quote came from none other than George Gallup, who was strongly convinced in his lifetime that you representative needed to pay attention to what the people are saying. Very recently, we had none other than Michelle Bachman, who was on Meet the Press with David Gregory saying, she was asked about her position on a certain issue, and she said, because that's the judgment of the people of this country, she said. The people of this country would love to weigh in. That's the problem with Washington. They're not listening to the public. And then she actually was rebuffed by David Gregory, which was fascinating, who came back and he was rather appalled. If you watch Meet the Press two Sundays ago, not last Sunday, but the Sunday before that, he said, but, but that's why we have elected representatives, Congresswoman, is what he said, blah, blah, blah. Is that the right thing to do just because the public say that's what you should do? I mean, uh, should public opinion be the sole determinant of how you vote on a particular issue? He was rather aghast that somebody would have suggested there that they were going to pay attention to public opinion. So again, right there on Meet the Press, an exemplification of these two different views of, of how public opinion should be taken into account. You know, you pay attention or you use your best judgment and you don't. Of course, we're seeing events around the world right now which underscore, I think, the value of, of paying attention to public opinion, at least to a certain point. Uh, Hillary Clinton was on Charlie Rose earlier this year. And I like this quote. She said, even in the most authoritarian regimes around the world, people are listening to the opinion of their public, Secretary of State Clinton said, and so there's a growing effort to make sure that your views and actions at home and abroad are aligned with what public opinion is. And we've seen in, in Tripoli and Libya, and we're seeing in Egypt and elsewhere, what happens when you have uh, leaders and others, certainly they're not representative democracies as we understand it, but who are not paying attention to the, to the views of the public. So all in all, we have what's a fascinating and very important dialogue going here from two extremes, from people on the one hand who say, even in an elected democracy, uh, we should not be paying attention to the whims um, of, the, of the people, the, uh, flim the up and down whims of the people. Elected representatives need to use their wise judgment to make decisions. You've had some of these, right, in this series so far this summer, you've had some wise elected officials here talking about it. And then you have, on the other hand, uh, the perspective that actually what these elected representatives should be doing is paying even more attention to what the people out there, the public actually thinks should be going on uh, as measured by polls. And the last is an important point because we have a miraculous scientific ability that we have developed today to be able to actually understand what 200 plus million American adults are thinking and feeling almost at any time. In Gallup now, we are interviewing 1,000 people a night, a random sample of 1,000 people a night, 350,000 people a year, and asking them questions about their health and their well-being and a variety of other issues, but also asking about the state of the nation and their political uh, interests. Uh, at Gallup now, we are now, under the uh, leadership of our CEO, have started interviewing around the world in over 150 countries, and we are committed to expanding so that we're measuring the opinions and the feelings and the attitudes of people in every country around the world as measured scientifically, which is the important point. We have a miraculous tool with, that we use, which is public opinion polling, which gives us the ability to understand what Americans are thinking and feeling, and yet we still have this debate on the one hand where people are saying, I don't care what your, what politicians call the P word, what your polls are saying, I don't care what your polls are saying, I'm going to do what I think is right, uh, as opposed to this other perspective which is saying, look, we're able to aggregate and understand the wonderful opinions of the American public, why not take these into account? Now, the good news, I think, from a broad perspective is that public opinion is, in fact, being taken into account by our leadership in a broad sense. A good friend of mine, a uh, colleague, uh, Robert Shapiro, is a professor of government at Columbia University, has just done a huge review of all the literature 
on the issue of how representative our elected officials are. And in fact, he says there's a fairly strong correspondence between what any mechanism we use, polling and other mechanisms, would say are the wishes of the people and the decisions, the policy decisions that are made by elected representatives. So in a broad sense, we don't have uh, errant dictators in this country who are veering off in this direction where the mass of the public says we ought to go off in that direction. In general, uh, we have a, a pretty good sync between what the public says should be done and what the official said should be done. However, we still have the other side of the coin. For one thing, we have politicians who are extremely ambivalent about even talking about uh, public opinion in polls in general. Even Obama, when he said 80% of the people support this, and that was great, uh, I'm glad he gave, he actually quoted a Gallup poll too, and he was talking about the desire for tax increases. He came out and used polling, so he actually used our poll, but he never used the P word. You know, if a politician stood up here in front of you and said, oh, well, I was monitoring the polls to make me decide what, oh, you know, that's considered anathema by elected, a lot of elected officials. Partly, I think it's an ego issue. I don't know whether it's selection or socialization, but men and women who choose to run for office have to have a, a strong ego, right, to get into that game. And once they're in there, I think that ego is stroked. So it doesn't take very long before they begin to say, hey, what do I need polls for? I'm brilliant. I'm smart. I'm endowed with superhuman judgment. I can make judgments that are in the best interest of the country. But we have the ambivalence on the part of people, and we also have doubts about polls uh, where people still wonder about exactly how they work, which I think needs to be addressed as well. I, I was recently on a television talk show with a graduate of this very university, Dartmouth, I think, 84. Her name is Laura Ingram. Uh, you may know her, right? She was, in fact, when I, I, I uh, was on her show, very neutrally, of course. Actually, she was quite respectful. Just before me, Charlie Rangel, the Democratic Congressman of New York, had been on, and she had tried to rip him up one way or the other. And all. When I came on, luckily, she was fairly uh, calm in her usual way. By the way, when she was off, we were off camera, she said, you know, in Dartmouth, the thing I remember about polls is we did a poll of Indi every Indian chief in America, and every single one of them showed us that they wanted the Indian to still be the, uh, the mascot of Dartmouth College not the, the green, right? Now, I don't know whether her poll was accurate or not, and you know, even while she was here, she was a strong conservative, but that was her interest in polling. But what she said, even her, she has a law degree, graduated from Dartmouth, one of the most outstanding universities in the world where everybody here is well-trained in, in how polls work, I know, and will be even more so with the brilliant faculty that's here now, of course. But as, I, as, as we were leaving, she said on air, she said, and by the way, I don't know about these polls. I've never been called. Nobody's ever asked me a question, right? And here she is, this very smart woman, asking the same question that I often get from other people, saying, I'm not really understanding how all this works. So although on the one hand, we, we have the, the knowledge that public opinion is having an effect, on the other hand, we still have ambivalence about it in the part of politicians. We have questions about it as well. And we also have a growing realization, I think, on the part of a lot of people who look at it, that there is great wisdom in collected together views and insights. If there's been any kind of movement we've seen in society in recent years, it's been towards more collective wisdom. There is a uh, website called about.com where the experts in an area publish things that you ought to do on a specific area, what wine you want to do, what hotel you should stay at, and all that. Yeah, website sits there, not successful at all. And then you have Google. How many experts work at Google uh, telling you what to, when you do a search? Zero. What you get with Google is the collective views of what millions of other people have done when they have searched for things and linked to sites and things along those lines. We have Facebook, which is the same way, aggregated Facebook. We now have Twitter aggregations where we can look at what people are doing. When you want to buy a book now, you go to Amazon and don't look for one book reviewer in the New York Times, whether they're up or down on it. You look for the mass of all the reviews that have been given. Amazon is extremely careful to have their uh, websites rated not by independent mystery shoppers, but who rates Amazon websites is everybody who's been there. They give them a rating back. So you say, well, I like that because they've gotten 55,000, you know, five-star uh, ratings on Amazon. Uh, we're going to Europe soon, my wife and I, and, and deciding what hotel to stay at, where do we go? We go to TripAdvisor.com, which is not one, uh, you know, Rick Seves or Arthur Fromer sitting there telling us what hotel to go to. I read through hundreds and hundreds of reviews of every hotel there and look at the collective wisdom of what these people are telling us. So we really are finding that the collective wisdom of the people in a practical sense more and more appears to have a lot of wisdom associated with it, and actually, that's what polling does. As George Gallup said at one point, 
uh, the ultimate values of politics and economics, the judgments on which public policy is based, do not come from special knowledge or intelligence alone. Do not come from special knowledge or intelligence alone. They are compounded from the day-to-day -day experience of the men and women who together make up the society we live in. In other words, the intelligence about what to do, how to direct policy decisions, does not just come from the men and women you've had up here in this series this summer, or the brilliant 435 representatives we send to Washington, or the even more brilliant 100 senators, or the even more brilliant uh, people we elect as president. But there's great wisdom out there by putting together the opinions of the average people in this country on a lot of issues in this country, and that's what we have the tool to measure. That's what we do with public opinion polling, and that's why I think it's so important that we integrate it into our ongoing policy uh, decisions. And it's not just me. We ask the American public, how much respect do you have for the decisions made by elected representatives in Washington? Bleh, very low rating. How much respect do you have for the decisions of average men and women in this country? Much higher. So the average American out there says, I have more respect for the wisdom of the men and women in this country than I do from the people we elect to go off and send to Washington. I was about to say the jerks we elect to send off because that's about what Americans are saying right now. I won't uh, bore you with all the statistics. Congress job approval now, well, I will bore you. Actually, Deb, I said I won't bore them with a long speech today. I'm quite capable of boring you with a short speech, right? So that's what we went on with it. I will tell you a few statistics. 13% of Americans approve of the way Congress is handling its job. That's the lowest in Gallup poll history of measuring Congress. We risk, uh, give a list of institutions every year and say, how much uh, do you have confidence in this institution? Well, dead last on that list is Congress. The military is at the top, small business is up there high, and so on, it keeps going and going and going, and now you're down at Congress at the last. We ask about the perceived honesty and ethics of senators and congressmen in Washington among a list of a large number of professions. Well, good news, Congress is not dead last, that's used car salesmen. <laughs> This is true. Right above you is car salesmen or lobbyists, and then right above them are Congress people, right? At the very top of the list are nurses. If any of you are nurses, congratulations. You have the perceived highest honesty and ethics of any profession that we test. Pharmacists are high as well. Uh, school teachers are high, and it kind of goes on down the list, but congressmen are at the bottom of the list. And these are the people we send off to represent us. The government system itself, we just ask Americans to rate their positive or negative reactions to each of 24 different business and industry sectors in American society. At the top of the list, computer industry. Americans have more positive vibes about the computer industry than any other sector in society. Farming and agriculture is very high. The Internet's very high. Way down at the bottom of the list, the very bottom of the list, is the federal government. Americans have more negative views of the federal government than any other business or institution that we test. So when you look at the American public and say, well, what do you think about this idea of simply trusting the judgment of these honest men and women that you send off to Washington, it's like thumbs down. Like, why would I trust the judgment of these people that I don't have any respect for, I don't think are doing a good job, and are part of an institution that I don't think is working very well in American society? Well, you put all of that together, and I think if you're just speaking, and that's what I do. As Deb said, I don't have opinions myself. I, my job is to try to represent the opinions of the American public. Well, what I do, and if I'm representing the public, is to say that the average American out there would say to their elected representatives, pay less of time to trying to be brilliant yourself and more time to trying to represent what we are thinking of feeling, we the actual Americans themselves. And if you don't, trouble can ensue. Just Monday morning in the uh, Trenton Times, our local paper in New Jersey, a columnist said, we need initiative and referendum in the state of New Jersey because the legislature and the governor are totally out of control. They're not responsive to the people. We have to go like California. With all of the problems they've had with initiative and referendum in California, they're saying we need it in, in, uh, in New Jersey because we've lost control of the process. And you've seen what happened in other countries around the world. I don't think we're going to have people in the streets in America, but to the degree that Americans feel that they are estranged from their elected representatives, the more discontent there is. We have 11 percent of Americans now satisfied with the way things are going in the country, not the all-time low, that's 7 percent in 2008. A lot of that's due to the bad economy, but a lot of that as well is due to the fact that Americans don't think the uh, situation is going well in Washington. Our friends at the Pew Research Center in the middle of the debt crisis debate in Washington prior to August 2nd 
ask a random sample of Americans, what word comes to mind first when you, to describe the, what's going on in Washington now? What was the number one word? Ridiculous. And then followed that was childish, stupid, idiotic. All of these negative words are how Americans were perceiving the process that was going on in Washington. So I said I wouldn't bore you with a lot of data, but I just want to drive home the point now that Americans are none too happy with how things are going in Washington. And I think part of it is they feel their views are not being represented well enough of what's happening. So I would come up with four things, just four points I would make real quickly. One is I think we all need to be clear about the role of public opinion in polls. Politicians don't like to talk about it, don't like to say they pay attention to polls. Yet in any major competitive race, what's the first person a politician hires? A pollster, right? They, um, they love pollsters when it comes to getting reelected. George Bush had a team of pollsters, both in 00 and 04, and he had them back in Texas when he ran for governor. Carl Rove just ran them. So George Bush could say, oh, I don't pay attention to polls, while he was paying huge attention to polls over there at the same time. And not just Bush. Evidence shows Franklin Roosevelt and Dwight Eisenhower and John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon. Everybody paid a lot of attention to polls in the White House. So they'll use them when it comes to re-election, but politicians are aghast at saying publicly that they would do it, and I think that they should. We need to be more honest about paying attention to polls. I think we need more politicians like me. How's that? <laughs> Not in an ego way, but when I go to a uh, cocktail party or a dinner party, people say, well, what do you think about the debt ceiling? What do you think about the health care reform plan? What do you think about legalizing gay marriage? My response is, well, 52% of Americans support gay marriage. <laughs> And I say, well, you know, the Americans are opposed to the debt ceiling agreement. In other words, I'm kind of a boring guest because I don't have opinions myself. And I often said, well, if I'm that way, maybe I should run for Congress. And by the way, I'd like to ask for your financial support. If you could all sign checks before we leave here, I'll be starting my campaign. No, I'm not. But if I did run for Congress, I would say I am the candidate who has no ideas and no convictions, right? <laughs> I would say I am the candidate who pledges to do nothing more but accurately and at all points try to represent the views of, of my constituents or the American public taken as a whole. I'd probably be soundly defeated, and of course that's too far to the extreme. I don't think anybody should do that. But nevertheless, I think politicians might benefit from being a little bit more like me in that sense, and instead of saying my opinion and feel all times obligated to be brilliant and wise, and those 435 people we send to Washington are not all preordained by a strike of lightning to be brilliant oracles, are they? They're just like us. Well, I would say, I'm just here to represent people, and I'm going to pay attention to polls to figure out more about the decisions I have to make. We have polarization in America today, and I think it may, may relate to the question CEO Imhout left, but we have a polarized system where I think the data show a lot of our representation isn't accurately representing Americans because we're kind of pushed over here to strong Republicans and strong Democrats for a variety of reasons. Uh, which we'll talk about, but again, polling helps obviate that problem because the polling's majoritarian and actually says this is what all Americans think, not just what representatives who were elected in these two issues, two particular sides think. We polling pollsters in the industry need to do better. There are conflicting poll results. A lot of you probably will ask questions, everybody does. What happens? Because one poll says people support gay marriage and the other say they don't. There are a lot of conflicting poll results. In my presidential address at the American Association of Public Opinion Research, which we just had in May in Phoenix, I said we as an industry need to do more to actually aggregate and put together polling results so politicians who want to know have a much better sense for where the public stands on these issues. Uh, there's a lot of good polling out there, but it's not well put together and we need to aggregate. Do a better job like the medical community does. You know, there was controversy, but when we had those recommendations a couple of years ago about whether women under 40 should have mammograms or women under 50 should, that was a, a meta-analysis, a compilation of a lot of different research that had been done uh, in many different studies. And that's more what we as an industry need to do is to put it all together so you could ask somebody like me, where does the public stand on an issue like the Health Care Reform Act? And finally, we need to keep the balance. Uh, we've been talking about it in some wonderful classes with some very brilliant Dartmouth students earlier today about this whole dispute between the delegate model, which I'm talking about, where when we send somebody off to represent us, he or she should be a delegate to do what we're telling them to do, like an ambassador, as opposed to a trustee model, which is where when we send somebody off, they say, thank you very much, but I'm going to use my own judgment and ignore you. Well, we need to be somewhere in the middle, is my conviction there, ultimately. 
our elected representatives have to use some criteria to make decisions. And I'm saying one of the strong criteria that these men and women should use is to systematically and publicly take into account what the great mass of Americans are thinking and feeling about these issues and not ignore it and therefore pay attention to the partisan positions, to pay attention to big money interests and lobbyists and the other kinds of things that Americans think are driving their decisions today, or to pay attention to their own internal wisdom, which in many instances is not all that wise. That's my position for where we ought to go, a, a position in the middle where we give more attention to what these great men and women in our country, the average Jane and John Doe's are thinking and feeling. And, and after all, what George Gallup said a long time ago was when a president or any other leader pays attention to poll results, he is in effect paying attention to the views of the people. Any other interpretation is nonsense. So when George Bush or Phil Graham or many of the others say, I don't pay attention to polls, what they're basically saying is, I don't pay attention to the people. And I don't think in a representative democracy, that's the kind of situation that we want to be in. Okay? I think you've been informed about the tradition of this lecture series and that um, Jeffrey Immel got to pose a question to you as all speakers got to propose questions mm -hmm. to later speakers. Of course, you don't get to do that, although we have an alternative <laughs> for you at the end. Right. Uh, and his question to you was, is there really anybody in the middle anymore? And if there is, why doesn't anybody seem to care about them? And I'm going to add a little bit to that and say, you know, academic scholarship has been pretty unified on the idea that politicians are getting more pol polarized. But there's still a question within the academic research about the degree to which the public itself is also getting polarized, or whether it's mostly just the politicians. Can you speak to these issues? That's a good I thought he was going to leave the question, how do I uh, get the stock price of GE to go higher and higher, right? <laughs> which is his, his main day, day job concern. Yes. Uh, but I appreciate his question. Uh, you're absolutely right. A lot of the data suggests that, as I mentioned, the representative process now is getting more polarized and a variety of reasons for that. One of them has to do with redistricting, which is going on now in every state in the union, most every state except for the uh, states like Montana that only have one representative. Uh, and redistricting is in more recent years for a variety of reasons tended to put Republicans, Republicans and Democrats in Democrat districts, which means that they tend to be more polarized and they're not people in the middle. There's some academic controversy about how much uh, impact that has, but that's clearly one reason. A lot of people talk about the media, and what people immediately say about the media in answer to his question is, yes, um, we tend to have now the establishment of not only cable news channels, but blogs and radio talk shows and other things that are extremely ideological on one side or the other, so people can just pick and choose, and therefore they're not exposed to the general views, and they personally become more uh, ideological, and I think that's a reason. I also think there's a problem with media in that they tend to gravitate towards more polarizing headlines rather than understanding what's actually going on in the news as well. And, and of course, we have a lot of people talk about money. There's a lot of money, believe it or not, in politics today, and that money tends to gravitate towards people on the extremes. There's not a lot of huge amounts of money flowing to people in the middle. If you're a large corporate interest, your main interest is probably supporting people who are very strong, like anti-government regulation of your industry. Uh, and if you're a liberal like George Soros or somebody like that, you're giving a lot of money on the other side to try to support people who are present, represent your liberal position. So politicians gravitate to money, and I think that's another reason we see this polarization. So that's why we, we lose these people in the middle. There's some evidence uh, in answer to your question that people are more polarized. We look at job approval ratings, and we have the extremes. It used to be you had more, some Democrats would approve of a president who was a Republican and a lot of Republicans and vice versa. Uh, you had, going back to Eisenhower or something, you have a lot of Democrats who would approve of Eisenhower as well as Republicans and so forth. Uh, particularly since Reagan and then through Clinton, we've had more polarization, and particularly through Bush and now Obama, where you've got 80% plus of Democrats who approve of Obama and like 13% of Republicans, a huge mirror image with independents somewhere in the middle. So using that as one indication, I would say the, the public tends to be somewhat more polarized than it was previously based on those data for the kind of reasons that I talk about. Where is the middle? Well, I think our polling has a great opportunity to play here because we are majoritarian. 
We found, for example, in the debt crisis recently that the majority of Americans said they wanted representatives to compromise in Washington, not stick to principles, even if the compromise didn't fit with their own personal positions. That's what the majority of Americans felt. Yet that was strongly opposed, and the compromise that was reached, a lot of people wondered just how much a compromise it was. So if you pay attention to public opinion and you look at majority opinion in, in response to uh, Jeffrey Imhelt's question, I think you're getting there some sense that there is a middle there out there in America in addition to the extremes, but because of the reasons we've talked about, that middle's opinion doesn't get out there a lot of time, and therefore, uh, by using public opinion research, we get a better sense of where the middle is. So that's one reason I would, I would say pay more attention to our kind of polling. Do you see more strong Democrats and strong Republicans than you used to And when you ask partisanship questions? It's a good question. I don't know. We didn't ask that question regularly enough historically, so I don't have good data on that. I don't know in the Eisenhower years if we would have had more strong uh, Democrats than we do now because Gallup really didn't ask it in the same, in the same position. Okay, so there's no way to know that. Um, can you talk a little bit about trust in government and its relationship to partisanship? And you know, some people have come out lately, for example, the, the partisan pollster and consultant Stan Greenberg made the argument in the Week in Review in the New York Times a few weeks back that Democrats, unless they can restore trust in government and trust in officials, um, will not be able to win effectively, uh, win over the public effectively, unless they can restore trust in government because the whole platform of the Democratic Party for the most part, or a lot of it involves building governmental programs and having government play a role in people's lives. Um, can you speak to that mm -hmm. issue and relationship at all? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question um, that we talked about. And we used, uh, somebody was using uh, healthcare and the environment earlier as an example of that. And it is true that the government is, uh, the Democrats are more inclined to think and I think this is President Obama's background as a community organizer. He views the government as a force for good, and you should use government to try to produce positive change. And a lot of people on the other end of the spectrum say government is a force for bad, and it should be used as little as possible. Uh, we actually, however, find that Americans are somewhere in the middle on that position. Although Americans don't trust government and all of that, they still, when we give them a five-point scale, You've got about as many people saying government should be used as much as possible to do good as you have on the other side saying a government should do as little as possible, kind of a Ron Paul libertarian position. And you have about a third of Americans who are right in the middle. So there's some sentiment out there on the part, some willingness on the part of the American public, I think, uh, to recognize kind of what you, in your question, or, or Stanley Greenberg might call the democratic position. You know, that government can be used for good. There's some willingness, I think, on the part of the public to recognize that. And we do know Americans are very much against cutting uh, Medicare, Social Security, government programs. So when you get to some specifics, Americans say certainly that's something the government does that's good. I think one of the issues that we've talked about today is efficiency and effectiveness. And this is where I think Obama and the Democrats may have mixed uh, missed the boat because our data show that Americans don't have much respect for the efficiency or the ability of the government to do something. Uh, we saw that when I mentioned earlier that uh, the business and industry-wise, Americans think the government is the worst business and industry they can think of. In other words, if the government was running Apple Computer, it would be dead broke, right, instead of this shining, uh, brilliant success story uh, where Apple has been able to create iPods and iPads and, and, uh, and iPhones and things along these lines that, that are directly meet the consumer's needs. Um, so I think the, guard, the, the public, that's a major concern. So somebody asked me, what would you do about health care reform? And I would say maybe one of the problems that Obama and the Democrats had is they didn't spend enough time talking about the ability of the federal government to actually execute this program. Maybe they should have appointed a military general or Jeffrey Imhelt, who's a CEO, obviously has experience running things, to say they're going to be the ones that are going to try to run this because we have a pledge that they can run it effectively. Or get General Petraeus who's now at a uniform head of the CIA, somebody like that to run it, because the military has the highest confidence of any institution that we track. So I'm saying part of the problem, Stanley Greenberg's right, but to convince Americans about trust in the government, it's more than just trust in the government. I would say the American public needs to be convinced that the government can be effective and efficient in what it does. Al Gore tried, remember when he was vice president? He had a big commission in innovation in government trying to get government to run effectively. Well, to my knowledge, it didn't make much change, right? But at least he tried, and I think that's, it's not a philosophic issue is what I'm saying in, to some degree as much as it is a perception of practicality on the part of the American public, that they just don't have a lot of trust in this behemoth of a giant bureaucratic institution up there trying to run things right now. 
into the sense that Obama and the Democrats are saying, we're going to do even more, right? We're going to take over health care and we're going to take over that and run that. I think the American public is saying maybe that's good in theory, because some of the data show parts of it are good in theory, but in practicality, we can't see that you have the ability to actually do that. And our data show, like on health care reform, a lot of people say, it's good in theory, but we don't think that our costs are going to go down. We don't think that the costs are going to go down for the country. We don't think that it's going to work in terms of increasing access. People just didn't believe that it was going to work, that it was going to be effective. So that's one answer to that question. Okay, I'll ask one more question as moderator and then turn it over to the audience. Uh, with respect to the power of presidents over public opinion, you often see presidents go to the public called going public in the academic literature in order to sway the views of the public of the public over to their side. We saw President Obama try to do that during the debt ceiling debates. How effective is that? Do you see bumps and are they long standing within the data when presidents make those moves? Does it depend on the president and has that changed over time? Have they lost their ability to do that as their as the number of cable television stations have proliferated and the number of internet outlets and so on and so forth. Yeah, I just saw a uh, kinescope of Nixon in his famous checker speech. Remember, he was accused of taking contributions in 52 when he was going to run as vice president. He went on air and said, my wife's not rich. We're not taking contributions. Uh, my poor dog, something about my poor dog checkers. Uh, that's all we have. And she has a wool coat and all this kind of, and apparently that was effective. He stayed on the ticket, at least with Ike. I don't know, think we pulled it. Uh, I say negative on the speeches. I'd say Obama's going to make a speech, as you know, in September to present his jobs program. And that may have some political reasons for doing it for other uh, people, but I would not expect any bump whatsoever in job approval. We're just not seeing much change. The only bump Obama's got recently was after Osama bin Laden was assassinated. His approval went up to 52, but fe fell back within three or four weeks. His approval's at 38 today, which is the lowest in his history. I don't think that speeches at this point move many people. I think it's like Jeffrey Imhoff making a speech uh, to stockholders saying, here's all the wonderful things we're going to do to increase stockholder value and revenues and profits. And there, at some point, they say, show us the money. You know, we need to see. And I think a lot of people on the economy, uh, based on our data, are going to be at the point where they say, we're going to wait and see actual improvement in the economy, not your discussion about how you're going to improve it. I think people are cynical based on data because we don't see the bump. So I would not expect the speech in September to have a dramatic overnight effect on our tracking of President Obama's approval rating. Okay. Let's take some questions from the audience here. I see a hand um, out here. Is that Barbara right there? Um, thank you, Dr. Newport, uh, for coming today. Um, you were just speaking about Obama's, President Obama's uh, approval rating. Um, in your knowledge of you know, presidential approval rating, um, you know, over the years, um, as uh, do you think that you know President Obama's approval rating can make a comeback, a recovery in time for 2012? Well, his his campaign thinks it will. <laughs> uh, we look at history; it's a small sample size. Ten presidents have run for re-election since uh, we've had modern polling since Harry Truman. Seven have been successful; three have been defeated. So it's a small sample size to try to look at. But we he's he's the lowest in August before his election year. His current 38 percent job approval rating is lower than any other president who was successfully reelected. So history would say he's in big trouble. Um, both Clinton and Reagan in August of the years before their election, and for Clinton that would have been August of 95, and for Reagan that would have been August of 1983, had job approval ratings that were in the mid 40% range or slightly lower, and they recovered. And by the time Clinton and Reagan both were running for reelection in the fall of their election years, they had job approval ratings above 50% and both coasted to, to, to victory, actually, Reagan didn't just coast a victory, he had a landslide victory over Walter Mondale by about 18 points in the popular vote in 1984. So it's possible to recover, but for Obama needs to be back up for job approval rating at about 48 or 50 percent minimum as an incumbent really to be in a good position to win re-election. Now that's a small sample, so maybe he can be the exception. But to go from 38 to that, his window's beginning to close some, and his ratings now are going down, not up. Um, as I said, the 38 today, his, his previous rating was 39 just a week or two ago. Now it's 38, so it's going down. So he's going to have to make that U-turn and start coming back up pretty soon because by next year, let's say next spring or next summer, things are going to be more set. And if his job approval rating is still low like that, I think his probability of being reelected based on history is going to be lower. So uh, time's running out for the Obama campaign, I would say. They, and that's why he's making a speech and going to do a lot of things. The good news for Obama is he has to run against somebody. And if the Republicans, <laughs> depends on who the Republicans come up with, 
that could give him a better probability if it's a, a candidate who doesn't have large-scale general election appeals. So that's why I'd, I think the Obama campaign uh, is probably hoping to have a more extremist candidate nominated by the GOP rather than a midstream candidate. Okay, let's take another question. Um, there's a question right here, the gentleman in front. Could you give us some insight, please, for the magic thousand people you talk to every, uh, every night? Do you repeat the same questions to these people? Y you must have reasons they represent the whole. How is it that they represent the whole? Just some insight as to who these people are and how you get mm -hmm. to them. It's a good question, and um, we spend a lot of time in our industry. I talked about the American Association of Public Opinion Research that I'm the immediate past president of, and that's the largest professional polling group in America. And if you were to come to our meetings, you would find 1,000 pollsters from government, academia, and private industry, all with technical papers on how you do sampling and how you represent people and how you do the statistics to estimate it. So it's a very complex and very sophisticated process that has evolved and developed all the way going back to George Gallup and his fellow pioneers in this field in the 1930s. Um, we don't ask the same people every night. We do a fresh random sample. And basically our goal is to give every adult in America an equal and known probability of falling into our sample. We do telephone interviewing now. We don't use the internet for general population because a significant percent of older people, for example, don't have ready access to the email. And also there's not a good sampling frame. You can't randomly sample email addresses very well. So we still use phones. We are now at the point where 40% of all of our interviews every night are done on cell phones because all these people in this front row here do not have landlines at all and we would miss them without cell phones. So we, we, we interview, we use random digit dialing to get on listed numbers and a variety of other procedures so that we go out we, the pollsters, select the people randomly, the 1,000 people. And the key is not quotas. We don't say, well, 12% of Americans are African Americans, so we're going to go to the local mall and find 120 out of 1,000 blacks. Instead, we randomly select, we pick, and then the distribution of that sample is remarkably consistent on every known dimension to the American public. For example, red hair. I don't know what percent of Americans have red hair, but if we randomly select percent. perfect, what percent? 2%. 2%. Percent. We have an expert here. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, data show they're the smartest and most intelligent <laughs> individuals in America. Isn't that right? Yes, <laughs> of course. Uh, but I would, if, it's, if, if uh, Professor Brooks is correct on the 2% estimate, if we randomly s select, we'll have 2% of our sample roughly will have red hair. We should ask that one night to prove it. What color is your hair? Right? I guess they get complicated. People would say, well, my real hair or my yeah, current right. hair color. Yeah. But we could do that. Or the hair I used to have is yeah, what right. older guys would say. But we, we do that, and, and it's, it's remarkably reflective. When we go through all of that process, we actually are able every night to get a sample of Americans who we think, this is our goal, the answers that they give to our questions would be within a margin of error, the same answers we would have gotten had we been able to interview every American. So I said 38% of Americans in our sample of 1,500, not 1,000, but 1,500 for that particular variable, approve of the job Obama's doing. What we're saying is, had we interviewed every adult in America, over 200 million of them over the last three nights, roughly 38% would have said they approved of the job Obama's doing. We say a margin of error, that's because sampling has some variance in it, so we'd say, well, it could be 40, it could be 36, but it's gonna be in that range, and our best point estimate is that it's 38%. Often your doctor, when he takes uh, blood pressure, he or she will take it multiple times and do an average, right? Because you have white coat hypertension, you go into the doctor's office and you're nervous and you're, and so they'll, they'll do it a numerous times, they do it at home and they'll average it. And that's what uh, they're saying, any one measurement has some error around it. So if, if your doctor takes your blood pressure, he says that, that has error, but your blood pressure is probably in, in this general range. Well, that's what polling does and, and we think it's remarkably effective. Are you convinced? <laughs> okay, okay um, let's take another hand back there. We, I see a gentleman back there. Good afternoon. I get your envelopes about once or twice a month. I am one of your polling panelers. Uh, when you ask questions, I'm sometimes torn with the answer probabilities. You don't always seem to have what the option that I would like to answer. So sometimes I answer in a way that might be interpreted or take the data and interpret it differently, such as do I approve of how Obama is performing his job? 
And there are a lot of times where I'm disappointed, but I'm disappointed that he didn't do more rather than disappointed at what he did. And that is not addressed within the questioning structure. So you can then it's open to interpretation uh, on your part on what I've answered. Well, well those are good points. Um, one other quick question. Yeah. How do I get how did I get selected? I've been doing it for five years. Well, I'm not sure if you're getting an envelope. I'm not sure exactly what that's involved with Gallup. But anybody who's, who's selected in our normal general population samples, we select them randomly. So you can't select yourself into our poll. Um, in answer to your question, um, those are excellent points. One of the reasons job approval, which we've been asking in the same way since Roosevelt's so good, is that it mimics an election. Uh, what Dr. Gallup used to say is when you go into the voting booth, you may, let's say you were voting in 08 between John McCain on the Republican ticket and Barack Obama the Democrat. Well, you probably had complex feelings. Obama's strong here, but he's weak there. You like McCain's position here, but not there. Unfortunately, in the voting system, you have to summarize it and pull one lever. So we're saying when it comes to the president, of course there are complex emotions about a president, but we're forcing you to summarize, and we think that's a good overall indicator of where the president stands. We also do a lot of sub-indices and get other things. In answer to your question, there are many ways of asking it, and one way we get around that is we ask questions in multiple ways and compare and contrast answers, so we don't just rely on one answer. On the death penalty, for example, in the answer to yours, our classic question is, do you approve or disapprove of death penalty for people in cases of murder? And about 65% of Americans still approve. Well, we know that's a conflicted answer, and a lot of people would like to give us a different answer, but we forced them into that because when we say, do you prefer the death penalty or life imprisonment with no chance of parole, the percent supporting the death penalty drops to about 52%. So we know some of those people who, when we gave them a binary choice, said, oh, yeah, I support the death penalty, actually said, well, if you're not giving me any other choice, but I'd rather tell you that I'd rather than be thrown into the clink for life. So we do have, that's what we do by asking it in various ways. We also ask open-ended questions, which I love. Why do you uh, approve or disapprove of Obama in your own words? And we code those. Every month we ask Americans, what's the most important problem facing the country? That's open-ended. So our interviewers actually type in the exact words people use and we code it and read the verbatim. And we did that on the debt ceiling. We said, why do you favor uh, lifting the debt ceiling and why do you not favor it? And in your own words, we typed them in. And in that instance, interestingly, we put the verbatims on, on our website. So you could read through a 1,000 Americans' own words they used for why they did or didn't support it. So you could get your own feel for what people were thinking. So we try to come at it that way to get at your issue. I think we have time for one more question here. And um, let's see, the lady in the um, yellow shirt right there. I'd like to go back a little bit to some of your introductory discussion about leadership versus following public opinion. And although in, in many ways I, I agree with what you were saying, the concern I have is where public opinion sometimes lags behind what is right. And maybe that sounds elitist, but I mean kind of go back in history and think about things like equal rights or equal opportunity the public would have been very often against uh, some of the things that we needed to do as a nation. And so anyway, that, that's not really a question. It's more of a, a comment that I would like to hear your yeah. reaction to. Well, it's a dialogue back and forth, and it's an, it's an excellent question. You, I think history tells us, and I'm not a historian, that Franklin Roosevelt was, was realized that he couldn't be too far ahead of the public in getting involved in World War II. The public was very isolationist. He felt committed that we needed to come to Britain's support prior to Pearl Harbor, yet he was reluctant to do it because he realized he couldn't go too far and lead public. So <laughs> leaders, unfortunately, even if they convince they're right, do have to be careful and can't get too far out ahead. Civil rights legislation, actually the American public out of the South was in favor of it in the 60s. So they actually the public had come to that point. It just wasn't in the South. That's what leaders have to do. I often say in that situation that the leaders should spend a lot of time trying to convince the public of their position. You know, if they're strongly convinced that we need X or we need Y or that something needs to be done, we'll take the case to the public and hopefully the public opinion will move in their direction. And if after year after year of arguing this, the public never picks up on it and never moves, you have to wonder. You know, how are these leaders so convinced they're right when actually you can't convince average men and women across the country that they're right? 
And at some point, you begin to say, well, maybe the men and women have something. You know, how can a leader be so convinced that he or she has all this, the brilliant wisdom of what's right uh, when the public doesn't come around to meet them? So it's, it's, a, it's a movement back and forth. And clearly, a lot of people, and particularly in civil rights and equal opportunity and all that, want to push the envelope. Uh, but, you know, gay leaders have been successful, I think, uh, without, you know, doing a lot the, with persuasion and the other mechanisms they've used have moved to the point where 52% of Americans now approve of legalized gay marriage. So I think they're willing to sit back and wait for public opinion to move, particularly as the younger people who support it get older and, and wait for public opinion to move in that direction. So I think there's a, it's a back and forth. Uh, there are some instances principal leaders need to take stands and, and not just always adhere to where the public is, but I have a lot of, uh, of respect for average John and Joe Americans out there collected together, and if they're strongly opposed to something, I have to ask the question. Uh, you, know, you know, on busing and integration, leaders said, well, this is the way to do it, but I think when you interviewed an average American, they'd say, I'm not sure busing is going to work, and it didn't work, right? It was inefficient and unanticipated consequences. So, there's a lot of wisdom out there. If, if I, I'm always leery of, of leaders who think they're absolutely right, right? Particularly if the average of public is opposed to it, you have to put those two together. A lot of people object to that. We love the movie 12 Angry Men, you know, where Henry Fonda stood up for what was right in the jury, and, and, and uh, Theodore Sorensen wrote a book, oops, John F. Kennedy wrote a book about profiles and courage, about senators who stood up for what they thought was right. So we have a lot of respect for iconoclastic people who, who stick to what they do, but I'm not one of those. I'm more majoritarian, and I'm, I'm saying, if it doesn't play well in Peoria, I want to know why. You know, why aren't these people coming along, and do they know something I don't? That's why, as a cocktail party, I don't have a lot of personal opinions, because I, I, I'm not an ideologue that's uh, so convinced that I know exactly what people should do personally. Well, since you don't get the opportunity to ask our next speaker a question, I'm going to give you the opportunity to ask the audience the question that they will get to ponder over the next year before our speaking series starts again next summer. So what do you think our audience here should be thinking about on topics of this nature? Well, it, it may be general. It's a good question. I didn't have time to think about it. But I would say that in my opinion, the economy is clearly the big issue in the coming election. But I think right next to it will be the appropriate role of government in American society. That is a key, key issue in American politics. So one question you all might want to ponder is exactly what should the role of government be or not be in American society? And you got extremes, you know, the socialist dream was that a government could make an equal and just society for everybody and we would all be wonderful. And you got the other extreme of libertarians who say a non-government society would be best. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle there. So that would be an interesting question to ponder. Uh, what exactly should the appropriate role of government in moving our society forward be in, in, in the future? Okay, well that's something for you all to think about. I'm going to ask Professor Whelan to come up here and close out the lecture series for us and say a few words about that. So first I want to thank Dr. Newport for being with us and being our final speaker and putting a public opinion wrap around many of the issues that we've been talking about. So thank you very much. Thank you. But more broadly, I'd like to thank the people who've been involved in pulling this series off all summer. As you know, people like the Treasury Secretary of the United States do not just pop into town for a visit. So let me talk about just a few of the people who brought all of the moving parts together. The first, uh, and the person who provided the whole impetus for the series, is President Kim and his office. For those of you who heard him speak, you know that this lecture series is part of his broader vision about engaging Dartmouth students in the community in our larger public challenges. And today we have David Spaulding from that office who's been kind of the go-to guy for our lecture series over and over again. Meanwhile, on the receiving end of this wisdom, we have 40 terrific students who have been involved in the companion course to this lecture series all summer. And when you walk out of here, you can ponder what was said. When they walk out of here, and every other lecture, they have to digest the material and write a memo. So there were 11 memo assignments over the course of the summer, which means that this dedicated group was thinking and writing about all of these issues rather than hanging out at the docks or fulfilling distributive requirements or doing other things that might be a part of summer term that are not quite as academic and engaging. Also, if you've attended the lectures, you've met the faculty who were involved, so myself, 
Deborah Brooks, Dean Lacey, Bruce Sasserdote, and Andrew Samwick, who collectively taught this course. And as head of the Rockefeller Center, Andrew was particularly supportive in making Rockefeller the center of gravity for both the course and the lecture series. Now, the staff here at the Hopkins Center and safety and security, you probably did not notice. The reason you did not notice them was because they were doing their job so well. And it's only when things collapse, particularly in safety and security, that they come to your attention. That never happened. We had this come off beautifully all summer. And also public affairs, one of the implicit messages of the series of bringing people to campus is we want to project far beyond Hanover that a small college in the middle of New Hampshire can punch above its weight when it comes to speaking and addressing these kinds of issues and attracting talent literally from all over the world. Last, there were three people who did not make the trains run on time, but they made cars, lectures, lunches, and just about everything else. There may have been a train that I didn't know about, but they were Jen Murray, Katie Horner and Kate Barlow, who were the glue. If you left this to just the academics, you would have been here at two. The speaker would have been here yesterday. We would have been here at six. So all great theory, you know, in theory it would work, in practice it would not, and they made it work. Now, as, as Deb alluded to, it was our tradition for each guest to ask a question of the next guest. We've run out of guests. But our last question, in addition to the one posed for you substantively, is to ask your opinion on the lecture series. This is something that we would like to continue going forward. So on the Dartmouth homepage, there's now a survey asking for your feedback on the lecture series in the hope that we can keep what works, improve what could be better. So if you could take a few minutes to go to the homepage and give us your feedback, that would be very meaningful. Last, uh, one of the pieces of feedback we've already gotten is, I think it was a student who said, can't we have more good news in the lecture series? <laughs> uh, um, there were a lot of very serious issues that came up. You may have heard what you, you may have liked what you heard, you may not have, you may have agreed with the politics or not, but there's certainly no doubt that the first step towards addressing each one of these very serious public challenges is speaking frankly about the problem about what can be done, about what has to be done, and about engaging the public in that effort. And in that respect, we have certainly succeeded. So I thank all of you for your participation and people like Frank who came up to make it possible. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your summer.